I'd like to move to is this residence time distribution section. And there's a little small hand up here. Does everyone have a copy of it? Introduction to reactive design and advanced reactive design. The advanced reactive design, we take a look at this issue a lot more strongly. Um, so it's kind of really where we've just ended off now is, the, is all that we need to know for intro to reactive design. This is now introducing a bit more of what happens in reality. So we've considered so far, we've considered very ideal types of reactors. Essentially two extremes. On the one hand, we consider plug flow reactors. And all the way out the other end of the spectrum is a CSTR. So a batch reactor really is a CSTR, but with the inlet and outlet closed up. Plug flow reactor, that's a PFR also a PBR. So those, those two represent real extremes in terms of operation. Everything else in reality approaches those. A, a plug flow reactor in practice will never behave ideally as a plug flow reactor. It will behave somewhere in the middle of the spectrum. And then all the CSTR behave like a, a true CSTR that you come across. It will almost always have some issues with it. Let's take a look at what some of those issues might be. As shown here in this handout, the CSTR coming in with the feed gets mixed up here by the impeller. And there's, here's my outlet at the top. So you can well imagine that some of the particles coming in spend pretty much no time in the reactor and they just channel across here and leave right away. So they come in with a concentration of CA0. The ideal CSTR tells us that the concentration leaving is CA. But that's not 100% correct. That is true for a large amount of material leaving. But some of the particles leaving, we spend very little time in here, and so are not completely reacted, and they would leave with a high concentration. Other particles will spend ages in that reactor, being simply recycled around and around. There's stagnant regions often in these corners. So those particles there will have ample time to react, and they will leave them with a much higher conversion. So what's really leaving here is a, is a concentration CA, certain conversion X, but it's the blend of a variety of particles. Right? If we had some way to ask every particle, how long did you spend in the reactor, you would find a distribution. Some particles have spent a very short time in the reactor, other particles have spent a really long time in the reactor that's clearly going to affect the conversion. We've got some notion of that already by using the residence type tau. Tau then tells us the space time or the residence time is the volume of the reactor divided by that volumetric flow rate Q. 
it tells me the amount of time that particles are spent in the reactor on average. It's one rough way of interpreting it. It's not totally true. The more correct way of saying it is the amount of time taken to replace the volume of the reactor. So one time to replace the entire contents of the reactor. But in general, you can tell it's already giving you an idea of the average time or typical time spent in the reactor. In a plug flow reactor, PBR, we have a situation where we've got our particles here. And it's quite clear that depending on how well this bed is packed, there's going to be some channel that will short circuiting. So some of the material is going to pass through quite rapidly. Other material is going to get slowed down where the bed is densely packed. And these beds are not static by any means. Because there's this velocity going through the bed, there's expansion and contraction with heat effects, over time these channels do develop, allowing some streams to leave the reactor more rapidly than some other streams entering. So the assumption we made earlier on of having an axial direction that's well, that's moving along at a uniform pace through that reactor, that's not true. We're definitely going to get some profiles building up in these reactors, in these packed beds, I should say, over time. So bypassing and channeling is the terminology that's used for that. Uh, so what you're seeing here is uh, some other types of reactors, but here in this packed bed, for example, as we've designed this packed bed, so our inlet is coming out here at the top, there's going to be some period, uh, some regions where we're going to blow that catalyst out of the way and create channels artificially, um, leading to some bypassing of the short circuit. So we, we recognize then that every reactor in practice will never be a pure plug flow reactor, nor will it ever be a pure CSTR. It will always be somewhere in the spectrum. Hopefully, we'll be close to this direction edge here if we are running a PFR, and hopefully we'll be close to this area if we're running a CSTR, but we can never be exactly a pure CSTR or plug flow. Batch reactors are, are conversely the only reactor that you really don't have to worry about this issue, right? Because a batch reactor, we put everything in, we close up the valves, and we agitate it, and every particle stays in the reactor for the same amount of time and then we drain the reactor out. So batch reactors really, are, we don't consider as these time distributions under batch systems. So well, what do we do about this and how do we measure this residence time distributions? We're saying there's a distribution, so from the stats course you know that what distributions are about. How long is that residence time for certain particles. What does the distribution look like for it? So let's take a look at how we get some of these RTDs. So how do we measure RTD? Well, we do an experiment where we inject a tracer inject a tracer into the reactor and then we take a measurement at the reactor exit. So I'll talk about that now in a minute. Let's measure the exit the concentration of the tracer. So it's not a concentration of A or B or one of the species. We measure the concentration of the tracer experiments or reactors on residence time distribution? Yeah, okay, so have any of you done your experiment yet? Okay, one person has. <laughs> okay, so, um, <laughs> sorry? <laughs> okay, so here's what it looks like. We have our feed coming in. Here's your injection point, and 
as soon as possible after that injection point. So we have that injection point occurring right at the reactor entrance. We inject our tracer. So this might be my pack bed reactor, for example, if I'm doing this. And then pretty much at the exit there, we measure and take a sample. So this is my detection time. Okay, so what is a tracer? Well, a tracer is anything that is inert that we can add to the reactor so that it will move through the reactor with the rest of the species. So we want it, firstly, it needs to be inert. So we don't want it to be consumed as well by the reaction. We want it to be soluble in the mixture. So if this is a gas phase or a liquid phase in particular, we want it to be moving with the rest of the species. So if we've got a liquid phase reaction occurring, this tracer should be liquid as well so that it moves with the rest of the system. Um, obviously it needs to be detectable at the reactor exit here. So where we take our sample and measure that tracer concentration again at the, end, at the exit, it needs to have similar physical properties. So viscosity and density of that tracer should be similar to the reacting and species as well as the reagents. And also importantly, it should not be absorbed by the reactor. So, so some tracers might stick to the reactor shell, some tracer might stick to the packed bed particle, so it should not be absorbed. Essentially, every, if I inject three kilograms of tracer, I need to be able to recover three kilograms of tracer at the exit. Okay, so what are uh, some typical tracers that one can use? Um, when I did my undergraduate lab experiments on this, we used food coloring. So you inject food coloring here, a known quantity, and then we used a spectrometer at the exit to measure the color leaving. Um, so you use some colored material. Well, if you're reacting solid particles, some companies will coat that solid particle with a special fluorescent coating, and then they measure the fluorescence of that particle's leaving. So the, the fluorescent amount leaving over time will show what that tracer concentration is. Uh, sometimes they would use radioactive material. Um, some companies, if you've got a gas phase reaction occurring here, you might make your tracer an uh, inert species. So helium, for example, would be a good tracer. You inject helium, and then you can measure the con concentration of helium leaving. Okay, so a good example of a tracer that's used in biological studies is um, uh, for prostate examination. So prostate examination is another, it's not just prostate, but I know this for prostate because I've done some um, research in this area on experimental studies where we analyze the prostate images afterwards to detect the level of cancer. What they do these days for modern detection is they inject radioactive material into your bloodstream. That will get preferentially absorbed by the antibodies present in the prostate cancer and get retained. So you take extra images of the prostate over time and if you see that the radioactive material disappears, again, you've got no prostate cancer. If it's retained, then you know that there's an issue there. So these ideas of injecting something and then measuring the response afterwards occurs in reactor design, it occurs in the medical area, and uh, there's a lot of money to be made. Companies really need to and want to understand what their residence times distributions are in their reactors because Anytime you have this inefficiency of channeling and bypassing and dead volume occurring, you're always reducing the reactor performance, right? You can be quite sure that these extreme examples of plug flow reactors and extreme examples of CSTR, these will get you the most conversion. So if I picked a plug flow reactor, it's because I'm going to get the highest conversion with that. Well, if my actual reactor doesn't behave like a plug flow reactor, some of the material is leaving faster and not spending enough time in the reactor, for sure my conversion is going to drop off. 
Okay, so almost always you can be sure that in like non-ideal behavior in your reactor is leading to poor performance. So we want to understand why this is occurring and by how much it's occurring. How would a PFR be affected like without a catalyst? That would be how would it be affected without a catalyst? Yeah, if there was no catalyst in there, then you wouldn't get channeling. Oh, okay. So remember we had said so a packed a plug flow reactor that has no catalyst in it. We had made the assumption that we've got a perfect axial plug that's moving forward. But we know from our fluid flow course we've got a parabolic profile. So some of the material is going to spend less time in the reactor than other times. How would exactly this happen in the tracer? Okay, so the question is how would injecting the tracer affect the flow? The injection of the tracer should not affect the flow at all. That's the whole uh, a very, very important part is that this tracer should not change the way the reactor is behaving. It has, but it will, it will dilute it by a small amount. So we add, by definition, a tracer is a tiny quantity relative to the feed. So we're really not diluting the flow rates, we're not changing things significantly. But then we're going to measure this distribution leaving. So let's take a look at what some of these tracer experiments look like, and that will give you a better idea of what's going on here. Let's take a look at some plots of what tracer data, tracer output looks like. Are they injected continuously for a period of time? Yeah, so that's exactly what we're going to consider. There's two, two ways we can do this. Uh, so two types of inputs. types of tracer experiments. One is called a pulse and one is called a step. So if I look at my tracer here, see again, this is a pulse input. What my pulse input looks like is I will operate at some period of time, inject a small pulse and then take that down to zero again. So this axis here is time. A step input considers this tracer being injected as you would expect in a step function. So like you've learned about in your process control course, you put a step input into the reactor. What does the outputs look like then? So again, with T, now we're measuring C out. So C out is what I measure over here. So this is C in. Let's add back C in is what I'm injecting that concentration of tracer in. Where I'm sampling is C out. So if it's a radioactive tracer, C in might be a known quantity of radiation um, going in. And C out, then I can measure that radiation leaving with time. Well, one example of this might be that at the time I make that injection, I start to see leaving my reactor Something like that. Okay, so this is called a C curve. Well, how does the concentration change if you have a Okay, so it's because there's non-ideal behavior. What would a, a, a perfect plug flow reactor's output look like? The same as the Okay, so a perfect plug flow reactor's in if this is the input into a plug flow reactor, a perfect plug flow reactor should show exactly that same pattern leaving. But we're saying that we know that these are not perfect reactors. There's this channeling. Some of the material goes through the reactor really fast, others gets held behind. So the output that I actually measure looks something like this. So the deviation of the ideal curve versus the actual curve experience is a measure of how, how different we are from that ideal state. An example of the step output might be um, it's an example against time of C out. So this was my pulse output. Let's 
take a look at my step response. So we could call that my pulse response as well, just to be consistent. So pulse response and step response for the given pulse input and the step input. Well, the step uh, response might look something like exactly like you see in reactor design, in fact. Something like that. And it will level off at that same point. Okay, so if I keep injecting this tracer and keep it up at a high level, eventually at the outlet of my reactor, I will see that maintained. Maybe, but it will take some period of time. And you hold it. So whatever, whatever, like let's say I'm injecting helium, yeah. I start at some period of time and I just keep injecting helium at a known concentration C in. Eventually C out will reach that C in. Yeah. And I eventually reach up to a new state. Okay, no, that's, no, it's, what should be clear to you is that this area here, that area under the curve will match this area under this curve. Yeah. So this, that pulse is actually really high, right? But from a mass balance, we totally expect that. So I'm putting in a certain mass in, this integrated area leaving must be the same. Uh, yeah, just so a pulse input is actually really hard to do properly because a pulse input says very rapidly like you inject a known amount of the stock. But it's very hard to actually do that in practice because at this injection point, you're already starting to get mixing and non-idealities occurring that are not due to the reactor, but just due to how you input the pulse. Okay, so we very often cannot really apply a true pulse in practice. So step responses are really easy to implement actually. Pulses are a lot harder to implement. Okay, so now let's take a look at some of the theory. So back to your handout there in front of you. Um, let's take a look at, at some definitions here. We say that we inject N0 moles of tracer. So you can always work in grams, perhaps, if you don't want to work in moles. It might be more convenient. Um, some companies actually use interesting traces. So for example, in the mining industry, I just want to show you a picture here. We looked at this before. Uh, these CSTRs are from a, from a gold mine in South Africa near my house where I grew up. And these CSTRs, there's about 10 of them in series. What the companies will do is they'll put different colored particles in there. So they just take plastic balls or ping pong balls or golf balls, and they just color them in different colors. And that's their tracers. So it's, um, it's a it's a similar particle size. They take particles that are similar size, colored marbles, and they put them through the system and they measure the number of moles out. So when we say N0 is moles, we obviously can't measure moles always of ping pong balls, but we can simply just convert that over to, to um, grams or number. So it just simply represents a number going in. The concentration at the outlet then is measured during a period of time delta t. And then the concentration CT is taken within that small time period. So for within a period of delta t, we assume that that concentration leaving is constant. That's a fair assumption. So what we can then derive is the number of moles within a period of delta t okay, so let's call that delta n so you can add these two notes there so that delta n is equal to c that you measure within that time period ct multiplied by the volumetric flow rate multiplied by delta t Okay, so let's just uh, do a, a unit that check here. So this would be moles per meter cubed. That would be meters cubed per second. And that would be seconds. So it is consistent. So delta n would be the number of moles that you measure leaving the period of time delta t of the reactor. What we can then do is say, well, if I'm measuring delta n moles leaving, 
what is the ratio of that relative to the total amount that I started off? So I injected n zero moles at the start. Delta n over n naught that is equal to CT times Q divided by n naught multiplied by delta T. So just divide both sides to get fractions. We're getting the fractional amount. So that's the fractional number of moles. Fraction, fraction. So fraction, no moles. So it's a number between zero and one. And this quantity in the numerator denominator is what we call E of T. So this is actually my residence time distribution function. So we call that E of T delta T. Delta N over N naught is E of T delta T. I'll just write it up here for those of you at the back. Delta N over N naught is equal to E of T times delta T. So let's just take that first equation that's up there on the board on that side. Um, we can write, well, I'll, I'll write it over here. So we've got delta n is equal to c of t times q times delta t. Well, if we express that in differential form, that becomes dn is c of t times q dt. And I can integrate both sides. I can integrate from 0. So I start by putting in no moles, and then I end off with n zero moles total. And then I integrate on the right-hand side from zero to in infinite time, I've added n zero. Yes. I'm just wondering, what do you mean by that? In a period of time. Take, we take these deltas, set them to dn's, delta t goes to dt, and we integrate from some initial time zero to some time in the future infinity. We've added over that period of time n zero moles in total. So that integral then, write it out, gets me n naught is equal to the integral from zero to infinity of c of t d times q times dt. Okay, so n naught is the amount that I've added, but if I didn't record it for some reason, or if I can't measure how much I'm injecting, okay, in, certain, in some situations we actually can't measure how much trace we're adding, I can always back calculate it afterwards from this integral. I know C of T, the concentration I'm measuring at the outlet. I know Q, my volumetric flow rate. I can go integrate that using finite differences or plot that curve and integrate the area underneath it and back calculate what n naught is. Just uh, one other thing to point out over here. Uh, let's just take this equation that we had over here. This delta n over n naught is e of e, e t times delta t. I can also express that in derivative form. I can write it as dn by dt is equal to multiplied by 1 over n naught. T. That would be another way of writing it. So just take the take the differences and set them to tend them to zero. And I guess you can see where this is starting to go. That E of T can write as one over n naught multiplied by dn over dt. Okay, and 
n nodes. Yeah. So you do. So n naught is all the tracer you add from zero to capital n naught. That's the tracer I add over whatever period of time I add it. So we, we say we integrate from when we start adding it to sometime in the future. We don't know. For example, the step input. So that, that's t. No, it's not till t. It's till infinite. Eventually, that concentration will go down to zero. And you'll just measure all the zeros. But once I stop adding my tracer, eventually coming up my reactor is not no tracer. So eventually there will be a whole lot of C of T's that are just zeros. You're just integrating a flat line at zero. So it still works out. It is totally good. Okay, so we've got uh, E of T is equal to dn dt times 1 over n naught. But from this equation up here, okay, from that equation mark at start, we can also find what dn by dt is. We get dn by dt is equal to ct times q. So I can substitute in those two portions now and simplify for what E of t is. So E of t is 1 over n naught multiplied by dn by dt. Well, dn over dt is ct times q. And n naught is this expression over here, the integral from 0 to infinity of c of t times q times dt. I'm actually going into quite a bit more detail than Fogler has. Fogler jumps over a lot of these steps and kind of assumes you can figure it out. But it's, um, it's helpful to see where the steps come from and interpret them intermediately. And then we end up by saying for most, <coughs> most tracer studies, so when we're doing these tracer studies, one thing we do aim for is to maintain our flow rate constant. So for most tracer studies, we maintain Q constant. And that gets us that, that some simplification, that E of T, that curve E of T, the residence time distribution function, is equal to C of T over N naught. C of t is equal to 0 to infinity times C of t dt. So this is actually quite, quite a, a great simplification and easy to interpret what the left and right hand side is. Sorry, what the numerator and denominator are here. Yeah? We'll go through this in tomorrow's class and look at an example and implement this uh, curve. 